powered by Go Goat Sports in partnership with TSN. This is season three, episode 18 of the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast. We've got Adam Foote, who really, Ray, has just turned into a professional hockey player's dad, if that makes any sense. And you know the role well, but he's going to check in from Utica, where his son Nolan is playing for the Comets in the American Hockey League. Obviously, older brother Cal is uh, playing for the Tampa Bay Lightning in the NHL. So some great stories ahead when Adam Foote stops by. Um we uh, put out a poll question this week, which I'm going to get to momentarily before we get to headlines. But, you know, an exciting week in the Granado and the Ferraro household, right? Yes. It starts, whether it starts, it starts. It's a hockey podcast, so it's going to start with Landon being named to Team Canada, representing his country at the Olympics. So the news made official from uh, a sport yeah. fan perspective yesterday. And Hammy Granado has a new book published, ready for the masses. When do I get to slide it up into uh, prime real estate right here? Well, right actually, um, because I'm so organized, yeah. I'm going to take a 10-second break and go get a copy just so I can show you. Okay. Um, but uh, this is a really cool project. Uh, it's a children's book, yeah. so you'll be able to get through it. Uh, Perfect. That'll be good for you. And um, uh, she's worked on it for a couple of years with her. Her nephew is the illustrator. So mm-hmm. Tony, her brother's son, Dom, is the yeah. illustrator. He's a super talented kid. And they've worked really hard on this. Awesome. And um, so uh, give me You go five get seconds. the book. No, I mean, you go get the book and oh, I'll read the poll nicely. question. Okay, yeah, you no, do that. I'm going to speak nicely. I'll start with Ray and Drake's Twitter poll, which we rolled out on Saturday. The poll question we asked, presented by Canadian Club Whiskey, which of the four division leaders by point percentage has the best shot to win the cup? Now, at the time we posted the Twitter poll, it was Carolina, Florida, Colorado, and Vegas. So uh, I'm going to ask Ray in just a second what order he thinks the people voted. But first, let's finish what we started. And I want to have a look at Cammie's book. So here's the book. It's uh, basically Cammie's story. It's called I Can Play Too. Uh, and um, she's had a, you know, when she was playing hockey as a little girl, she was it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were no other little girls playing boys hockey. Yeah. And she had a coach that uh, really believed that she should play, which might sound obvious today, yeah. but in 1977 was not right. an obvious thing. And he stood by her. He encouraged her, her parents had to support her to play Mm -hmm. because again, all the girls were figure skating. Right. Cammy it's in the book. Cammy kept sneaking over to the hockey rink. (laughs) She didn't want to wear a dress and and wear white skates. She wanted to play. And so um, this book is honestly, I, I read it and I'm like, man, it's so cute. And I think I can't wait to see it. it, It's uh, so she's really proud of it. So yesterday, a couple of pallets for books ended up in our garage uh, in the same morning that, uh, you know, we find out Landon has been, well, we knew, but it, it was announced that he had been selected to the Canadian Olympic team. Uh, so a very emotional, happy day for us. And parents will know this. There are, there are lots of days that are just days with your kids, you know, yeah. you're doing your thing and you're, there's not a high, there's not a low. It's just, you're, you know, you're doing your thing. And then there are these great days that'll be burned in your head forever. Mm-hmm. And uh, yesterday was one of them for, you know, for us here. It was just, you know, I couldn't even answer a text without getting three more. Ah. And it was just so cool because it was all, it's all about Landon. Yeah. And I'm, he's had a long road. He's had, he really has. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of injuries. And uh, this just, it's just amazing. He called yesterday from Davos where the team is training right now. And there's just a light to him oh, you know he's just so good so happy so proud to be there and so now uh now we'll wait until the 10th when they uh, february 10th when they uh, the men's team gets going now anyone listening to the podcast or uh, perhaps watching on youtube uh how do they get a hold of cammy's book i can play too uh well uh ali who is who does just about everything for us as you know behind the scenes and our twitter stuff and our social media stuff she will have that. They're not ready to make their um, their release yet. The website okay. is up and running. Perfect. Um, 
but uh, we will have that for them. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to pester you to tweet it out. And <laughs> I will um, for sure. And uh, honestly, when when people get to this book, yeah. their kids will love it. It's it's really a it's a sweet story, well done, and um, uh, it will be available. I would say within the next next ten days. Um, like everybody else, our house is getting through a yeah a boat of COVID, and um, uh, somehow I'm the only one that doesn't and uh, have it, and uh, everybody's just getting ready to return to normal. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, as you were fetching the book. Uh, I asked, or I, I went and revisited the uh, Ray and Dreg's Twitter poll, which was posted on the weekend, uh, which asked which of the four division leaders by points percentage, Ray, uh, is the best rated, I suppose, or has the best shot to win a cup. Um, what order do you think that people voted in, Ray? Carolina, Florida, Colorado, or Vegas? What order would you go in? Colorado. Florida, Vegas, Carolina. Uh, Colorado, Florida, Vegas, Carolina. All right. Colorado, 38.5%. So you got that one right. Florida, 30.8%. You got that one right. Carolina, 19.8%, third on the voting list. And Mm. Vegas is fourth on the list at 11%. See, the the biggest problem I would have voting for Vegas is they've got to get through Colorado. But then I go, well, wait a minute. Vegas doesn't even have half their team yet, and they're still winning the division. And then I go, what if Colorado gets their goaltending sorted out? There's lots of questions to be answered, Dregs. I get it. Uh, By the Uh, way. By the way, if I was was attentive and listened to Allie. Yeah. So if you want to pre-order the book, you go to camigranado 21com Yeah, Allie just texted both of us. I was going to jump in on that as well. Yeah, because she knows that I'm not paying attention. No, camigranado 21com You can pre-order, I can play too. There we go. And we will tweet it and retweet it and do all that we need to do um, as soon as it's ready to fly. There it is. Look at that. I can play too. Congratulations. This, this was the, the Huskies, their team that they played on when, uh, <laughs> when she was a kid. All right. We've got to jump into headlines, Ray, presented by our friends at Boston Pizza. Uh, you know this, but let's remind our viewers and our listeners, Boston Pizza has over 50 menu items to make everybody yeah. in the family happy. I'm, I'm not suggesting Tuesday night was a Boston Pizza night for the Granados and the Ferraros, but it was a special occasion. Which, you know, that would that would invite Boston Pizza to make it a party. Um, and you've got that wide variety, right? You've got full selection for the picky eaters in your home. The the I think the variety of the menu is what hooks us. Is yeah. because somebody yeah. can always find whatever it is they're looking for. Right? That's yeah. For for me it does you know, it's pizza or pizza or pizza. Like <laughs> I, I just I love it. I, if, and, if I could eat one food forever, that that's would be what it. it would be. Nice. Oh yeah. Not even question. Well, you probably have 40 other options on the Boston pizza menu beyond, uh, beyond pizza. So pick it up, get it delivered to your door and let Boston pizza do the cooking tonight. Vancouver, Jimmy Rutherford, the Aquilini's, the Vancouver Canucks, uh, make it a splash this week, Ray. Uh, announced on Wednesday as we record, Patrick Alvine is the general manager of the Vancouver Canucks. And Emily Castengue was named as assistant general manager on Tuesday. So two very outside the box to a degree, but significant hires by Rutherford. So what I think is pretty cool, in essence, Vancouver's management office is an expansion team's office. Lots of empty offices. No people in them. Uh, under Jim Benning, they had a very small staff. That was the way they wanted to do it. Jim's view is different. Mm-hmm. So as the president, he gets to fill those empty offices with whoever he wants. And what right. he has is a vision. Whatever his vision is, yeah. is going to employ different people from different 
different avenues to build a diverse, more original front office staff. And I think that must be really fun and really yeah. invigorating for Jim to, to be able to do that. What, what I see when I look at this, though, is the day of the one general manager with one assistant running an organization is done. Yeah. It's, it's just, it, it's too big a job. So they, Jim hires an assistant general manager right away from Pittsburgh. And so the two of them are starting to put things together. Then you have, um, you know, he, he hires Rachel Dory to jump into the analytics yep. department. Another then he hires yep. Emily Castengay, uh, who of course was a, a terrific agent, mm -hmm. uh, to leave the agency business to run the cap, to run the finance side of it. And now he hires Patrick Alvine, who he knows from Pittsburgh, to be the general manager. But he's not, this is the key part. He's not hiring somebody that's not going to work well and seamlessly as possible with the people that he's already hired. Yeah, He's not going to do that because he has the vision and he's not burdened with people that have four and five years left on his contracts. Right. Right. He's able to build this how he envisions it. Then yeah. once you get the team together, then you got to go to work and you got to plug the holes and make the trades and draft the players and all that stuff. But yeah. why wouldn't it make sense? And I don't, and I, I, I mean, this isn't even a question. It's just fact now is that why wouldn't you hire opinion from diverse places? Agreed. And so that, that to me is what, with it, whether it's Emily or Rachel or Patrick, it's, it's all diverse. It's all coming from different avenues. Yet you start building a one goal team, which is mm -hmm. to a one goal organization, which is to build the best team you can. Well, speaking of the best teams and, and building in a, in a way that is going to make you competitive moving forward, you know, we're looking at two franchises right now that are just, mired in turmoil and you know the Montreal Canadiens have gone through a great amount of change they've got Gorton in there he hires Ken Hughes the new general manager just over a week old in Montreal so I don't know that we should expect a whole lot current from the Montreal Canadiens other than you know there's going to be considerable change in the future what are you seeing or not seeing with the Philadelphia Flyers now Flyer management came out, uh, senior management, and endorsed Chuck Fletcher, said he's our guy, Dave Scott. Um, you know, they, they've, they've talked about the fact that they've got an open checkbook to, to spend, do whatever you have to do to make this team competitive. I mean, I don't know about you. At the start of the year, I thought Flyers were going to be decent. I didn't think mm -hmm. they were a contending I team. Yeah. I, I thought they'd be worthy of, of playoff consideration at least. What has gone on in Philadelphia that has put them in this spot? Well, it's never one thing, right? Yeah. Never. For for years in Philadelphia, they chased the next best goalie, whomever that was. Yeah. At one point, they I forget the amount of money they signed Ilya Brzezgala for. Yeah. And then a year and a half later, they bought him out because he couldn't stop a, a curling rock. And, you know, for a while they had Roman Czech Manic, and then it was on to the next guy and the next yeah. guy. Then they draft Carter Hart, and it seems like they've got their goaltending solved. Well, one of their issues is their goaltending's not been good enough. They go and they trade a first round pick, a second round pick, and Robert Hogg for Rasmus Ristolainen. Like, that's an enormous pay yeah. for an a second pair defenseman at best, right? Claude Giroux is not the Claude Giroux of 90 point Claude Giroux. No. Sean Couturier has been injured and banged up. Nolan Patrick did not work out for them. Yeah. They went and signed Ryan Ellis. He's played four games for them. He's mm -hmm. been hurt. They've got young guys, Joel Farabee and Morgan Frost. And they're just, I watched them play. I was in Philly. Like they're young. Yeah. They're, like it's hard to evaluate them yet. They're just so young. Travis Konechny scored 20 goals and now he looks like he's never going to score again. Mm -hmm. So it, I think they've lost a clear vision for what they're trying to be. I think there's always a pull in Philadelphia to be what they used to be. Right. That doesn't work anymore. Mm. They're not, 
they're either not big enough and tough enough, or they're not fast enough and skilled enough. Mm -hmm. But you can't be a little bit of both. Like you have to have 100% an identity that you can build your team into. Doesn't mean every player has got to be the same, but there has to be, you have to get on the same road. Right now it's like a, it's a bunch of guys yeah. that are playing. We often talk about good goaltending. We often talk about bad goaltending. One thing we don't often talk about specific to goaltending is whether or not the goalie should be suspended for his actions right. on the ice. Now we know that Aaron Dell uh, has had his hearing with the Department of Player Safety. So while people are listening to the podcast, chances are we also know what the number of games is. You know, is it one? Is it two? Is it three? What is it? Uh, he takes out Drake Batherson on Tuesday night. Unfortunately, Batherson is is hurt on the play, a high ankle sprain, which is going to keep him a out of the All Star. Uh, Brady Kachuk has replaced Drake Batherson on the All Star roster, but out of the lineup, the Ottawa Senators for a considerable part of a uh, point of time. I mean, right. that high ankle business can be tough, right? It, um, it, it literally could be the rest of the year where be. he's not effective. Yeah, you know, not not like he was playing. He was having no. a fantastic year. Uh, like, is that one of those situations where? No different than a player, the wires just touch and your emotions react and you do something that, in fact, he's done before, right? He did it to Mark Stone um, and, and he has a bit of a history here of being a, a, a hothead. So, again, people are listening. They know what the number probably is mm -hmm. when this is posted. But is two, three games fair for what you saw? Oh, well, OK, so how does it happen? I mean, he's given up three goals. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they don't have it this night and Batherson just happens to be the guy right in the way. Yeah. Right. And so he, he'll get a couple of games, but I, I don't, I don't see this as any different than plays that happen all over the ice. Right. And I'm always a proponent of suspending more, not less. So I don't have a problem with Aaron Dell getting suspended. I have more of a problem that there seems to be um, always a road to place some blame on the guy that got hit. Yeah. Oh, he should have had his head up. Oh, he, he lowered his head at the point of contact. Whatever it is, whatever the explanations are, there's always something that shifts the blame a little bit to the guy that got fouled. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that's the way it is. And sure, that's... That's fair. That's legit. But it happens too much. Like, like what could Batherson have done different? I don't know. He can't run over the goalie. He's no. got to go around him. And then the goalie hit him. Yeah. Now, if it was five feet in front of the net, it would have been two minutes for interference and nothing would have happened. But however, yeah. he was close to the boards. He hit the boards. He sprains his ankle. So are you suspending Aaron Dell because he sprained it? Or uh, are you suspending Aaron Dell because Drake Batherson sprained his ankle? Like that's wrong to me. Either yeah. you're suspending the act or you're not. Yeah. It's like Drake's me and you were in front of the net and I cross check you and I go to cross check you in the chest, but I miss and, um, and I hit you in the chin and you yeah. lose your teeth. Should I only be suspended because you lost your teeth? What if I would have hit you a little lower and you just got a bruised jaw? Right. No, you should be suspended anyway. Yeah. I agree and with I, that. And so I don't, that's my disconnect, I would say, on that, that yeah. sort of situation. Okay, two more quick things in headlines here. One, uh, again, we're at the mercy of our posting here. Um, Evander Kane seems real likely that he's going to sign with the Edmonton Oilers. Sounds like he's likely going to escape punishment from the National Hockey League by form of a suspension anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so let's assume Evander Kane is an Edmonton Oiler. What do you like about him from a hockey perspective and, and what it does to the dynamic of the Edmonton Oilers top nine? Well, um, I watched the Oilers in Vancouver uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, we were at the game and I'm watching them and I'm going, you know what? I can see why they think this team is pretty good. Mm -hmm. They didn't have Zach Hyman. And of course, Kane's not even with them yet, but it's pretty easy to imagine them with Kane playing with McDavid, and you go, hmm, 
I could see why that. What if they put Puyi RV on the other other side? I I watch Puyi RV. He's like a dog on a bone. Like he, <laughs> he's a little bit of a train wreck. Like he's dropping a his stick bit. and lo- yeah. losing his glove <laughs> and all that. But man, he plays hard. And so I'm like, wow, that's a pretty good line. And gee, that would leave you Hyman and Drysidle and Yamamoto. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pretty good line. Maybe you drop Nugent Hopkins into the three hole, and Oof. Dylan Holloway comes along, and then you got Warren Fogle who started to play really well again. Yeah. All of a sudden you're like, wow, that's a pretty good team. Now, they got Mike Smith has to get healthy or they're yeah. screwed. But what does Kane bring? Size, scoring, speed. I also think for all the trouble that the guys had, and a lot of it seems to be self inflicted, um, you're gonna get thirty five games of his best behavior or he's gonna be out of hockey. Right. Yeah. And so that's gotta be part of their bet, I would yeah. think. Now, if the league goes through their investigations and the government say he can travel back and forth, then, then what else are you going to do? Right. What, 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 like, no, whatever else you have to dig into behind the scenes, they should be, the Oilers should be digging into it. Yeah. All right. Um, because things are changing well, we hope they're changing in a positive way in Ontario with some of the restrictions, not being lifted, just loosened on Monday, uh, end of January. Um, I, you know, I'm still hearing rumblings, and I don't know if you are, especially among the Canadian teams, especially in Ontario and Manitoba, where the restrictions are fairly extreme. And you know what? Who's kidding who? It's basically like that across Canada. But, you know, if you put yourself in Winnipeg, you know, Winnipeg is a small market anyway. Um, yep. Now you've got the restrictions that the players and their families have to adhere to. And every day there appears to be a cold weather warning in in Winnipeg. You know, is this just not a disadvantage from a competitive perspective? I mean, if you're a player there and you're looking at the, the 25 teams in the U.S., right, and your contract is expiring, or, you know, Winnipeg seems to be floundering a little bit, right? They got to start winning hockey games. You know, are they going to look for help? Probably. They probably want to add some some spice on the right side up front. If they can try and do that in a pandemic and get players to wave their no move and whatnot. I we've talked about this before, but it feels like it's becoming more of a problem on the short term and potentially in the long term as well. Well, which player is going to say, yeah, I want to go to Winnipeg right now so I can sit in my house. No. Right. Like it's, it, it is a competitive disadvantage. Yeah. Mark Chipman has no fans in his building and and no hope to get them anytime soon. Yeah. So from a strictly hockey perspective, it, which is what we're talking about. Exactly. Um, it is a competitive disadvantage. So I'm at the game in Vancouver last night and there's, I don't know, 9,000, 10,000 people there. Cause that's what was allowed there. Mm-hmm. Felt like there was somebody there. Yeah. Felt like there was some revenue coming in. The guys in front of me were pounding beers like crazy. They were having a great time, (laughs) right? Now, everybody's got their mask on, except when they're drinking their beers or eating their food. And Winnipeg is among the teams that has nothing. Ottawa's got nobody there. Like, how, how do you expect those places to attract players? Nah, and and can't. I guess in essence, that's not the government's job. But if you're one of the owners, you've got to be banging on the government's door saying, what are we doing in one part of the country that we're not doing here? Is the virus different in Vancouver than it is in Winnipeg? Mm-hmm. Is this performance art? Like, wh- what what are we doing? Yeah. Like, you, they need some clarity so they can get out into the marketplace to try to do the best they can. And, it, and it's, I, I don't envy them. And it's, and, Pretty clearly, I sure as heck don't have the answers, right? No. Both from a, a health and a sport perspective. I mean, who no. does? Pretty Nobody. clearly we don't. No. Our interviews on Ray and Dregs are brought to you by our friends at Canadian Club Whiskey who are asking, are you over beer? Why not try a refreshing CC ginger ale with lime next time you're having a drink or watching a game? All right, here I am. Sitting with two successful hockey dads. Uh, I've got Adam Foote, who's in Utica, eagerly awaiting uh, his son Nolan Foote's game. 
with uh, Utica and Ray Ferraro, who, of course, Ray, as we talked about earlier in the podcast, elated with Landon Ferraro named to uh, Team Canada's Olympic team. So they're in Switzerland, ready to, to go over to China. I mean, both of you guys, Footer, let's start with you. I mean, you've gone from successful hockey careers, uh, spent some time in coaching, and uh, now you're spending all of your time watching both Nolan and Cal make their way in pro hockey. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. Uh, I was lucky when I retired to be able to coach them a little bit and, and help them. Um, as far as now that they're in pro, I think my relationship with my wife would be better off if I moved to the South Pole for four years while they develop. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Ray could tell you. Oh, but, yeah. Hey, Ray, I want to say congratulations on uh, your son on the Olympic team. That's exciting. Yeah, oh, thank you. Great, yeah, great amazing day yesterday. It was great. Yeah. It's awesome. Hey, hey Footer, when you're watching, like, it's, it's impossible for me anyway, to just like disassociate myself from the emotion of watching your kid play. Yeah. I'm assuming it's kind of the same. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's nights where you're looking at it like a, a father and you're like, you know, you, you want more, right. Or opportunity. Then, then you look at it as a, a guy that's we've had experience in the game. And for me, I just have to remove myself from, how my knowledge now with the, you know, watching so much hockey and, um, and I try to remember back my first couple of years and Cal, my older son said at best, he was dad. I saw one of your first games and <laughs> class and he goes, you lost your coverage all game behind it. But the guy was behind you in front of the middle of the game. We go, yeah, you're right. Cause I remember my, my dad telling me that like when I was younger, <laughs> Hey, you're missing a guy behind you. And I, and then I'm glad he said it to me because it really made me realize that there is a development stage and, and you can tell as a coach or tell as a parent or, you know, try to give them advice and make, give them good bullets. So they have a great weapon. And most of the time you just have to learn by experience, you know, and, and going through it. And uh, so that's one thing I've learned. And uh, just to remove myself from, I, I, as a player, you know, so you see it coming, right. And yeah. I'm sure you've been there where you're like, okay, this is going to be a tough couple of weeks. <laughs> you yeah. just have to let them go through it right it's hard it's hard to sit there now is it is it uh is it harder to watch cal who's a defenseman than nolan who's a winger because the the comparison i would make is landon's a penalty killer and he yeah. told me at one point dad you never killed a penalty in your life so <laughs> and it was so I that became that. really easy i don't know what the hell he's doing out there i sure never did it well, Ray, you can't kill penalties when you're always in the box. I couldn't believe your minutes when. Uh, that's a lot of that's a lot again. of chippy slashing penalties. <laughs> <laughs> Dregs is asking me, "What do you remember about Ray last week?" And I'm like, "Well, shit, I remember his offense, but I also remember he was feisty and chippy, and and you couldn't push him out of a game." Then I looked up your stats, and I go just to check, and I go, "Holy shit, he had a lot of penalty minutes." And then I'm going, "But this, how about the 80 game season, 40 and 40?" plus 25, 92 minutes. I'm going, that's a season. That's a good stats. And plus 25, you need to make the playoffs that year. That's a, that's a real good sign. Uh, well, yeah, the crazy, a lot of those penalty minutes, though, were because you'd wander through the front of the net, and you guys didn't have any rules back then. And so you'd go there, like, your arms would be bruised for weeks. Like, right. You guys, like, that was, I. you know what I remember, Adam, about you was skating around, Anytime in front of your net, you always had two hands on your stick. And I hated it because you'd get in yeah. tight and then you were me or anybody <laughs> else. You were, you were about to get it. And I mean, well, you had, that's how you looked at yeah. it, right? In well, front, it like was, that was your it spot. Was, it was fun because they're, well, you didn't want them to get in front. So the box of, but once you, they got in front, then you had to do your job where do you, you had to be hard on them, but know where the puck is. But I loved it back then because there was one ref and way less cameras to get suspended. So you can do the hack whack. But I remember being in playoffs for the first time and I forget who someone turned around and, I went and whacked my finger and broke it. And I go to the bench and Finner goes, Stephen Finn goes, it's on footy. It's on like, it's a hack whack. Let's go. <laughs> Come on, here we go. <laughs> so, Well, it's, it's funny though. Like, I, okay. So you're talking earlier about experience and gaining experience for your boys. But same thing for you in that spot. Like you, you just got pushed to another level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, it's, I think you, you have to get the reps, you have to play, you have to have a coach that believes in you. But 
um, it, it's about the reps experience, but com- just competing, right? Like uh, um, all the best players that win, like I look at Sackick and Forsberg, uh, I mean, they competed. They didn't get pushed out of a game, you know, and that's uh, looking at the boys. Yeah, it's experience, but learning how to compete. And uh, I always worried that when my guys left our house, my wife's like, what's your concern? I go, well, my dad, when he washed the dog, he, I remember going to take the dog to the lake and he'd throw a stick in the lake and then he'd come back with the stick and he'd put shampoo on him. He wouldn't even rub it in. He'd throw the stick back in. There's, there's the dog's <laughs> bath. And I go, my dog's bath. We've got this deal in Denver where this stable type card on the a trailer comes up and the dog goes in there and he gets his hair blown out and he comes out all fresh and smells great. And I go, so my wife go, that's the problem. I go, that's what my concern is, like how, how bad they want it. But I think today, kids, we, we all want to give them more than what we had. And uh, but it's just so different, um, you know. Now coaching when they coached us to now how you have to coach these young guys is completely different. I think, um, but uh, it's amazing how the world's changed that way, right? The, the hardness, the toughness, and and uh, so that was always one of my concerns. But they've got it. They they were raised. We believe they were raised the right, right way and know how to how to get, get dirty and grind. You know, like I said, I'll go back to it. The best players, like Eiserman and, and you know, you look at you look at Eliash and those guys. They just didn't get pushed out of games right. and uh, they competed. When your best players are hard, they, you, you win. You know. Now, when you guys were in Quebec, I I'm, I was always so fascinated that you know you like one day literally you're in Quebec and the next you're in Denver and yeah. that whole year there were you know I remember there were all that the rumors and the talk about you know it might not work in Quebec they might have to go somewhere else and we're looking at your team which wasn't really the avalanche yet but yeah. we're like that's a really good team but they're so young and they're I wonder if they will be good like did you guys know then that you were close oh. like I remember Joel skating around number 88 in his first year. And I'm like, this kid, he looks really good, but man, he's so little and skinny. And, and you guys were getting smashed every night, crushed, but you could right. see there's lots of good players. Like, could you guys see that? No, we were too young. We were too busy at Dago Bear, you know, like uh, we weren't paying attention. Good spot. But, good spot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, you know what? Um, you gotta, you gotta think too, like Joe went through a couple more years than I did in, in Forsberg and that, but of the tough times, but we were so young. We didn't know it was, we, we weren't that good. Right. And we, you look at the Lindros trade, the players have brought in for us. And then, um, you know, it leads to, we had that really two good years in, in uh, Quebec, but you have to lose first. And the Rangers just made it in the playoffs, but they, they won the year before and, and they took us down and then we go to Colorado, but we did not know, uh, how good we were, at least I didn't. And, um, but then if we don't go to Colorado, I'm not sure that if we're sitting up in Quebec that Montreal makes that trade. Right. Uh, letting Wad come to us. And I love Facetti. I mean, he was playing so well, but at the end of the day, if you can get your hands on a goalie, like, you know, top three goal in the league, uh, you, you have a better chance of winning. And so when that trade came, not only Wad and his leadership, but Mike Keen, to me, Mike Keener was, I thought Wah was a great. There's, I played with so many great leaders, but I, I think Mike Keen was the best leader I ever played against. He could hold you. Why is that? Why is that? Like, what what would he do different? I mean, you know, I know Mike Keen is a hard player, but also is a really funny. Oh my god, funny, funny guy. <laughs> yeah, he could. I remember I went in and I I wasn't feeling well, and and uh, Crawford was our coach, and I after warm up I went and I threw up, and I had the flu or something, and. Crow comes and goes, how'd you do in warm-up? I go, oh, not so good. He goes, we'll have a good game. And then we're doing, <laughs> we're having the anthem. We're on the anthem. And then, you know, I'm sitting there for the anthem on the bench and and uh, the anthem's over. You put your helmet on, Kino Chown. And he goes, footy, no effing excuses. Eh? And I go, what do you mean? Goes, Are you, if you're in, you're in, you know? And it, it, I'll never forget that day where I went, I totally understood what he was saying. Like, wow. like no excuses. You play with a broke finger or dislocated shoulder, a bad growing, you win or you lose. And uh, I think it's the hardest thing to teach youth and young people, especially in today's generation, that you're a pro hockey player, you're getting paid, uh, you win or you lose. Like if you're going to be on the ice, whether you have a broken rib, you have a broken rib. 
you know, but uh, Keener could do it. He could hold people accountable with like what you said, he was funny and, but he played hard too. Like he, he, he was in that battle with you or he would lead the battle. And for his size, like his toughness was, was, was right up there. So um, I, I thought he was, there's things he said to me that I've never forgotten. Now tell me about your, you're in Colorado. You guys don't know the city. You don't, you know, you're playing in that rink that was dark and small and we all hated coming in there. They had the sign, uh, Remember when you walked in and it said you were now one mile above sea level. It was like your oxygen got sucked out if you walked in there. And you guys, you made it hard in there. But did it, was it right away? Or I don't quite remember. Or was it until Patrick came? Because that, you guys became elevated then, of course. We we were, we were good. I mean, we, we, you know what, we, you look at both cup teams and, you know, you have the second cup with Borky Blake, the defenseman, but then you look at how good and underrated our, our first group of D were. Um, we're, we were just hard to play against. Uh, um, we had, we had depth. We could big guys that would fight. We had guys that wouldn't get, you know, that could score goals, but uh, no, we were good right away, but we were young. We were, I wasn't sure how good we were. And I remember being in the playoffs that year and we we're going in all those overtimes with Chicago and I couldn't believe how good they were. Um, but my dad said to me, he goes, I remember calling me, he goes, hey, you're closer than you think. And, and he always told me it's so hard to win a cup. You might never win. He goes, hey, hang in there. You're right there. You guys got this. And, and that, I think until that point, I didn't even realize we had an opportunity to win a cup. But, um, yeah, we were, we were just, we were hitting stride at the right time. And, and then, uh, thank God, uh, they left Wa in in Montreal and he got piped by, pumped by Detroit and <laughs> right. yeah. we got him. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about Patrick Waugh, uh, Flutter. I mean, you know him probably as well as uh, any teammate. I think you were roommates with him for a stretch, weren't you? Well, uh, Patty was my roommate for eight years, eight, eight seasons. Uh, <laughs> and you know what? The, it didn't start off well, to be honest with you. Like, um, I was like, so I, I remember playing in Calgary and I messed up and the two on one, or at least I found out later, I did mess up according to Patty, but we're, <laughs> we're a two on one. It goes in. I let the pass through and I I'll never forget it. We, we turn the lights up, the TV's down. And, you know, after a game, it's hard to sleep and you're sitting there for like, it was, seemed like 20 or 30 minutes. And I hear old Patty get up and he goes over to the, 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 the desk and he, uh, and he turns on like his butter, butter. And I'm like, yeah, I wasn't sleeping. He goes, you up? And I go, yeah, I'm up. He goes, get over here. And I went over there and he's got the notepad, eh? uh, notepad out and a pen. He's going, and he's showing me how to play a two on one. <laughs> and I go, he just couldn't sleep and it was bugging him. Right. And I'm going like, I'm thinking to myself, are you serious right now? Like you're telling me this at this moment. Right. So <laughs> he tells me how to play the two on one, never wanted to pass through. I'm like, okay, I got it. And then I remember when Blake, he came to our team and, uh, Blake didn't play that. He played the two on one like I did in Calgary, and they scored right. And Wa wasn't happy. And and uh, I remember in practice, Wa was skating around with Blakey, and I saw Blakey's face, and I went, "Oh, he's a little bit upset here, or whatever." And I went over to Blakey. I go, "Did he tell you how to play a two one?" He goes, "Yeah." I goes, "Don't worry, he does it to all the D. He just wants to be on the same page. The problem is he, the way you know Patty's got that French, and he just comes direct hit right. <laughs> and you don't know him. You don't know him. You're like, what the hell's going on here?" But, I'll, you know, the beauty of it is we're playing against Dallas and uh, Medano comes down on me on a two-on-one after a while, taught me, and he was doink top shelf. And I'm like, oh, gosh. And then same period, Medano, two-on-one again, a second goal, top shelf, over watch shoulder. I go on intermission and I go to Patty. I go, hey, you want me to play that different? He goes, no, footer. He goes, it's a 6% chance of hitting it. He's a great shooter. So just keep playing it the same way. So years later, we're retired and he's working in Colorado night. We talk about it. I go, Patty, you remember? I goes, yeah, I remember. That. I go, man, did you just do that to keep my confidence high? He goes, footer, I'm not that smart. <laughs> you know, so I think he truly, he just truly believed that that's, you know, when you think about it, you want to play it how the goalie wants you to play it, and it gives him he can cheat or take that five percent cheat, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, people, Patty was misunderstood by a lot of people. Um, I got to say, Flutter, let me jump in. Yep, there was yep. no goalie I loved scoring more on than Patrick. <laughs> Nobody, because <laughs> he was in, 
it, it was like it was personal to him. Like oh, yeah. whoever scored. So I loved scoring on him. He was right. without question, my favorite guy to get one on. Yeah. And it was always yeah. a cheesy rebound or something. It was never nice, but I didn't well, he care. Would, he would chirp you, right? Probably back or yeah. say something or, or look at you. But uh, you know, it's funny in practice when he came to our team, Joe always practiced. Joe's leadership was how he played. And he, uh, he went into uh, on the, Joe would always play on the road. It didn't matter what barn he was in. Um, but Joe was a leader of his work ethic. Right. And, when Wa came and I'm watching Joe work and then they had a competition every, like I, I never saw a goalie. I've never played with a goalie that tries that hard in practice. Really? Like, oh, he, every single one he would try. And I, I said to him one day, I go, what are you doing? He goes, well, I just want to, it's hard to turn the switch on when the game comes. Right. And I was like, I was amazed by it, but guys were so afraid of him, but I room with him. I'm sitting in the corner and practicing. A new guy would come on the team. They're afraid of Patty. I go, I go shoot high up. Because well, I don't want to piss him off. Who cares? Let one rip, you know. And so I'm in the corner. And I'm just firing pucks. The two on ones coming. I'm firing pucks on the back of his legs into the net during practice. And and he didn't care. He he just he'd look at me and tell me to get lost. But he he just didn't care. He was so focused on on his game. I mean, I've never been around a pro that is that focused on 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 winning in his game. So Footer, when you're when you're talking about his competitiveness, it's not just him though. Like across the board, you guys, you know, like Peter Forsberg was a vicious competitor. And Joel did it more quietly, but if there was a loose puck, like Joel was getting it. You know, like well, I think of Joel as his wrist shot and you know his clap, but like he was strong. Like so was that the way you guys practice too? Like not every day, but is like was that internal as well? Yeah, we practiced hard. I mean, guys competed hard in practice. Joe wanted to score on Wa. I didn't want Joe to beat me ever in the corners. And um, Forsberg was always the same as far as his viciousness, as you said. I, you know what? I, I, it's, it, it's such an argument, but Wah, Forsberg was as good as – look at how good Joe was. I mean, but – but look at Forsberg. He, he's probably the only guy, and the reason I say that, I think he could be the best player I ever played with. Um, he's the only guy that wowed our bench every game. And what I mean by that is if he's out on the ice and we all look down at the bench rolling around, did you see that? Like, he just did things with physically, with the puck and his brain. He, he ch- kind of changed the game. Like, you look at how Sydney plays Crosby in the corners and how he protects the puck and cuts guys' hands with, you know, cuts their body and – and removes him from the puck and he's he's just draw, trying to draw that second guy so that he's off his someone pops open right and i i don't know i thought uh forsberg was unreal uh, yeah. and in his compete right and and the thing is like all, all of us he was such a competitor that even like wah that five ten percent you could get him off his game right because mm-hmm. the yeah. compete made him so special but it also you could get him you know <laughs> that's so but uh yeah, we, I think you're right, Ray. We, we just were lucky. And I think any team that wins, and you've been on some great teams, uh, your best players practice hard, play hard, don't get pushed out of games. And, and uh, they, those, we had a lot of those guys. When I, when I think of the, of the competitiveness of your team, of course, I go quickly to the Detroit yeah. you know, series oh, that you guys, or years of series that you had. Uh, tell us a little bit about the – the madness that led to the goalie brawl to the, you know, to the one that everybody knows, but it was game after game after game for you guys, not just that one game. You know, we're just nothing against Dallas or our side. I mean, that was when Philly on the other side was coming up too. Right. But I think that our, I really believe the two best teams are Detroit and Colorado there, but the madness, you know, what's funny about that is the Draper hit the same game. Kozlov, I went to hit him and he, he, he backed, smashed the back of my head and I had 20 stitches, but um, no one ever, we don't talk about that. We talk because then Lemieux reacted the way he reacted and both hits were dirty and, and wrong. And, uh, but it was back in a day where it was just like that. And, uh, you know, yeah. um, it created, not only do you have like the toughness out of dead marsh against Shanahan, I mean, uh, the defensemen, like look at the defensemen they had in ours. And, and then you've got, Larry on off and Fetter off and Eiserman and, and Sack, you know, Forsberg. It was just, we were so well matched. And I think over time, uh, 
you know, they sustained. You, how, how do you get Federer off in, in um, Eisenman? And then, and then they, their draft, they jump in with Zetterberg, Daxu, right? And like to be able to continue that run. And, um, you know, I, I thought they had good goaltending too. I think, no disrespect to Osgood and Vernon, I just think, imagine they had just another top they might have won a couple more, right? They they, just, they changed the mm-hmm. game, but I think that the Russians there, they just the way they played the game is they kept the puck. And there's so many coaches now too. And um, you know, I noticed a lot of French coaches do it. It's always up, up the boards, up the boards, up the boards, always up the boards. I remember playing with Ray, he comes to our team and he goes, footer, see, Detroit has the puck all the time. He goes, We work so hard to get it. Why are you giving it away? Right. Mm-hmm. And Ray says he goes, give it back to me, you know, or go weak side. And uh, I just they, the, the Russian group that went in there, the way that Red Army played for so long, it changed the game. They had the puck on their stick. And as you know, you played against them. So, But it was such a great rivalry. Those, those that hit, um, it was going to be a rivalry no matter what. But, you know, the way Drapes reacted and then um, McCarty and that and the goalies come out. And, and Patty was one of those competitors too. Like Hexel scored, so Patty wanted to score. You know, I remember. <laughs> right. I'm like, oh, God. now Yeah, but Patty couldn't the- shoot. No, he uh-huh. he's calling for the puck, right? We're, we're, we have DD, he's calling for the puck. We're dropping it to him. Then he kept missing one day. Go, okay, that's enough. I'm not dropping the puck. This looks stupid. You're really not- <laughs> and, then, and then he won't, and then Patty wanted to fight, you know, and then it was Detroit. And I thought uh, Bowman was a genius. I thought they beat us when we let Malpe, McCarty, Draper, when we let the love point, when we let them affect us. That was what Bowman wanted to do. Um, For sure. And uh, when we didn't pay attention to them, we, 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 we beat them. You know, when we've put our focus on Eiserman and those guys, you know, uh, we, we were, I thought we were better. So do you, do you still want to punch Chris Draper in the face? Or are you finally <laughs> over it? You know what? It was so funny. We had the outdoor <laughs> game. And the, the, hey, the media guy in Colorado was going at me that outdoor game. Footer, who would you? I go, buddy. It's we've been retired. I don't want to punch you. He goes, no, no. Like, who would you want to punch in the face? And so I said, Draper. <laughs> Draper was so mad at me. I guess I went national. <laughs> I don't want to say that. Draper, will Draper fl- drive down here to Utica and give me shit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna but say t- that. No, I know. But look, I mean, you were noted as being mean, even though you feel now that you didn't play that way. But I think Ray has illustrated oh. how super competitive you are. Take us back to, and, and a very decorated Canadian. You had a great success record of international play. Was it 98 in BC, kind of mid-season where you've got a bit of a camp going on? So you're out there with who? Shanahan, Lindros, uh, and there's battles happening. And Wayne Gretzky, what, pulls you aside or puts you and Shani together, didn't he, for the picture? Um, you know, it was pretty – I don't know how you know about this, but it was pretty funny because uh, – yeah, we were before we were going to Vancouver to have that camp. And um, I remember getting in a stick fight, like a little, literally, and I know Corson now, but we got in a stick fight in the ice. I couldn't believe they let it happen. We both should have got 10 games for it. You, you, know? you and who? Uh, Corson. And uh, it was just so vicious, right? And then <laughs> Lindros and I got into it, and Shannon and I fought a couple times. And I remember the team picture. And I was so nervous. Like, I, you're a kid. You're not sure if he should be with that group. You're like, I'm in a team picture. Like, I can't believe I'm wearing the jersey. I'm playing for Team Canada. And Gretzky's our captain. And the guy's ready to snap the picture. And Gretzky goes to the guy, whoa, 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 whoa. And everyone's like, what's going on? And he turns back to me and he goes, Foot, are you good with everyone here before we move on? Like, do you want to <laughs> whack someone? Like, I'm good. And he goes, okay, you can take the picture. And I... <laughs> I, I don't know why he did it, but it was funny. But uh, I'll tell you, um, you know, that's when I figured, okay, well, that's not, not that bad that Wayne said that. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> what was it? Okay, so what's it like to get with that group of players? Like, you know, you, you, you at some point, you got to take a half a step back and go, I do belong here. Like, wow, this is an amazing group of players and I'm part of it. Yeah. You know, the, the amazing thing about, playing at that level um you know when you're killing a penalty or and you're in the you're in the d zone and that weak side forward you, you see in the game you look at the highlights every night and the weak side forward gets a little bit lost or someone gets behind them or the weak side of the ice gets exposed right and 
it was amazing to me how smart the guys were like the intelligence mm -hmm. you could just you, you don't have to play with a guy and then all of a sudden you it feels like you play with him for 10 10 years you know when ray got traded to us i got a chance to play with him the first game and i called my dad after and he goes how was that I go, you wouldn't believe it like i'm going i didn't do anything and i was like had an assist plus two the guy I, I knew where he was like he was amazing like his level of play right to be around those guys to see their their intelligence was impressive and when you're when you have more guys than not that are at that level of intelligence, the game's faster and uh, smoother and uh, mm. just great to, to be a part of it, you know. Did you have a favorite teammate or is it too hard to – or favorite couple that for whatever reason, doesn't have to be a great player, just a guy that cracked you up, made you feel good going to the rink? You know, I I was lucky. Obviously, we're the guys in hockey, there's a lot of great teammates and um, – you know, I was Blake. He was fun to be around. He's just such a class guy, and I loved going to the rink with him. And um, he had that calm, classy demeanor, which was great to be around for sure. Um, and uh, what's funny is all those great years in Colorado, and, and the movement of players is just too much, right? There's too many mm -hmm. players moving around. I'd say Joe and I've been through the most as a teammates, but I guess we were such a bad team in Columbus, but we just weren't that good. But I. I, I I don't know why it's so much fun with Freddie Modine and, and Jody Shelley. Uh, I'll never forget those guys. Just um, maybe we helped each other out, get through those tough times. Maybe we needed oh, yeah. each other more. I don't know, but I have a fortune that Scotty Pearson was my first roommate and we're still in touch and he's a good friend of mine. And Jamie Baker, the list goes on. What were you like as a roommate? Did you, did you demand the remote? I roomed well, with Pat Verbeek, and that little bugger never gave me the remote once. <laughs> you could beat up Pat, though. No chance. That little hey. pig farmer, he was all over me. <laughs> no chance. You know what? Wad had the remote the first year, and then he seriously, honest to God, this guy loved Murder, She Wrote, Angela Lansbury. There's a game. I said it, and I'm like, I hated that show. Like he, And he liked the Andy Griffith show. I'm like, oh, my God, Patty, we're not watching this again. And uh, I took the remote off him. But the thing about was, I was, I was always a prankster. We were doing goofy stuff, um, scared him and that. But he always wanted to have a pillow fight. You wouldn't believe it. Like he, every long road trip, we we're having a pillow fight. It's coming. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I couldn't believe as smart as he is, how dumb he was in the room in a pillow fight. So he, footer, let's go. And I'd be like, no, I'm not doing this. Like had a few beers last night. I got headaches. He no, let's go. We're, and he's standing up on his bed and he's got one pillow and he's like this, right? Every time. And I'm like, I stand him on my bed. I go, all right, he's not going to stop asking until we do this. And I always grab two and I would spin the pillows, right? Okay. And, and he fell for it every time. And he'd go for it. And I always locked the one pillow up and I just beat the crap out of him. Like I beat him every time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he kept coming back. So, but, uh, Okay, yeah, what's your best what's your best prank on the road? You say you were a prankster. Did yeah. You? Yeah. The, well, there was a lot of pranksters. Blakey was pretty good too. We did a couple. One I can't tell you, but I'll tell you off yeah. air. But it was it was Blakey's <laughs> idea. It was so much fun. It was great. It was it was with Korea and Morrell and our trainer. But the, the other one was uh Korea again. And you know, I don't mind saying this because the guys will laugh. We thought Korea was a little bit too cheap and we'd always bug him about it. You know what I mean? And I hope he's he been driving. He's too. been driving the same car for 20 oh, yeah. years. It's oh, unbelievable. Yeah. I think he's got the same big star jeans on probably right now in Anaheim. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, so one day Blake, he goes, where I got, I have Korea's uh, key. And I go, okay, what are we going to do? And he goes, well, we're meeting down a lobby at six for, for, uh, for dinner so we go to we go to dinner at six but before we go blakey and i go in his room and we take the bed out and uh we we bring a crib in from the maintenance <laughs> elevator like you know we bring a crib in, put a crib there take his bed out and then we turn up the heat take the batteries their mold all this stuff and so blakey sets it up at dinner and uh we were wondering if we we're gonna play the credit card game or who was gonna pay and we're like like he goes, Korea never plays. And I got on. I go, yeah, you're so cheap. You never pay for dinner. You never take care of the guys. And he's like, screw you. And then I'm like, well, why don't you, let's do something. Let's go back to your room, watch a movie. And you're going to order us dessert. And he goes, yeah, yeah, you guys come back. There's like eight of us. Yeah, come back to me, bit. And so he, he goes, well, I'll buy you guys dessert. So we go back and he just opens the door and he's like, 
fuck you you know <laughs> he lost his mind and he's go go get my bed and he knew it was blake and i right <laughs> Blakey's around. yeah we had fun blakey was a big prankster boy quiet too he'd oh, up he up and then hide hide in the back he, he, he yeah yeah he he every every road trip he was doing something now did you you were there uh jeff odgers and sean donovan were there right yeah yeah. Okay. So yeah. those two knuckleheads end up in Atlanta. So yeah. uh, one of my last road trips, I uh, we're out having a lunch that turned into a little longer. We're on the road in Long Island. I go back to my room and I open the door and the room is a thousand degrees. And then I look, everything in the room is stacked on the bed. The dresser. <laughs> the chair on top of the dresser at, at the very top is the shower curtain over the top. Oh, go nice. The bathroom. I go in the bathroom. I know it's those idiots. And I'm, I go in there. There's nothing like not one item in the bathroom. And I'm like, there's, there's no way this is all they did. So I flush the toilet. And they'd taken the little tube in the toilet that goes into the big tube and they'd propped it forward. If I was sitting down, that would have hit me right in the back. It shot water <laughs> nice. straight out. I'm like, you. <laughs> and they were like, they denied it forever. And I know it was those two plus Chris Tamer. Three of them. So I had to go get somebody. I couldn't lift that. You know, the long dresser in your yeah, room? Yeah, you <laughs> How are you going to get that down? I was sweating sweat right, right. yeah and it, oh, it was brutal brutal just all you want to do is go back and watch the show order dessert and go to bed but yeah they, that's the best part about the game is is the locker room and the guys and doing things like that they're all big kids right uh what's next for you footer i mean you've coached you've been uh in hockey ops uh, post playing career so what's what's yeah, next? i was lucky i mean sex would let me do the uh what we call it a part-time job or whatever uh player development and things like that so i could be with my kids and um did a little bit with kurt over i did a little bit of coaching did a lot of minor coaching but i i love to teach and and i love the game so much and uh i love communicating with the young players and helping them out so whether i think it's time to jump in player development or try to get back in the game with some coaching and i just enjoy it so much learned a lot um and, you know, I can't, like Ray will tell you, you can't go to every game with your kids and, and be there. They have their own life and, and they're on their way. And, and uh, you know, these are long days in Utica waiting for an hour dinner with the kid. And he's looking at his watch like, I got to go home. And, you know, you know what are you doing? You got to watch the show. But um, I just can't chase them around. And, and it's just fun. I, I it but, but it is hard, too. The last year and a half, the empty nest deal, my wife looked at me yeah. like, oh, my God, you've got to get a job. Like, like oh, you're, <laughs> you're here too much, you know. So, um, yeah, I was yeah, – I think, I think it's time. I mean, I can only go to Whole Foods so many times with her. And she pulled the she pulled the cart the one day. I go, what are you doing? She goes, we do things fast. I got a coffee. I'm listening to music. It's, you know, but – so I think she it's time. She wanted to get moving. She wanted, she wanted to, to get moving. Yeah, yeah, she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> so um you know it's time to the next chapter right and, and you know what I was going to jump in early when I retired and I just miss the kids so much and so I loved being a those days those first five years being around them a lot and mm. I, I had so much fun going to the rink and coaching those young teams and there's so many of those guys that moved yeah. on too so it's great it's great all right, Footer. Well, we've taken up enough of your day. Uh, enjoy the ride. I know you are. You're in Utica. You're heading to Tampa Bay. You're going to catch Cal. Uh, your focus, uh, at least this week, at least temporarily, is uh, on Nolan. So all the best to the boys and uh, look forward to playing golf with hey, you this summer. Hey, hey, Dragger, can I say one thing? Yeah, yeah. When you, when, you asked me, when you asked me about Ray last week, and I knew he was feisty, but I knew he was skilled too. Yeah. I went and looked at his stats, and I don't look at stats. I, I, I don't look at him because I, I didn't have any points, so there's no sense. But, hey, Ray, I'm pissed off. You played two more games than me. So that's combination, oh, wow. combination of playoffs. Okay, I got one question then. Season. I'm looking through your stats before we go here. How the hell did you get 11 goals one year? <laughs> but you know how hard I worked on it after practice? I worked on my one-timer for three years. They finally put me on the second power play. It took me three years of every day showing them I can, I can shoot. 
And I remember my dad saying to me when I went to Quebec, I was so pissed off because I didn't have my sticks, this and that. And he goes, and I was playing against, I was lucky. I was playing against top lines early. He goes, Hey, you can skate and you're big enough to keep up with those guys, you know, physically. And he goes, you have a great gig. And it took me 12, 15 years before I accepted my role. And I was I, cause America's about the, the hail Mary, the grand slam, the hat trick. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you I wanted 11 it. every year, didn't you? I hate it. I'm like on the O line, you know. <laughs> so, Old yeah. ones comes in there, you know, and uh, he's he's out for second on the power play, pumping it in. But maybe I didn't even have the ability to do that. But it was, I was happy to get the. And you know that eleven, I had a bet with a ref every year that I would get ten goals, and I only did it once. And that year, <laughs> one ref called off a goal. I really had 12, but my foot was in the crease. <laughs> Why was I in the crease? Man. Were you <laughs> ever lost? You, you yeah, I was lost. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Footer, That's I got to awesome, tell you, Footer. congrats on your career. It was an amazing career. I'm glad I don't have to play against you anymore. Yeah. Because <laughs> my arms are finally de-bruised. And uh, <laughs> all the best with you and the boys okay. and your family. And uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, Ray. Good luck to your son and play for Team Canada. Thank you. All right, we'd like to raise a glass of 43-year-old CC. To Adam Foote for joining us today on the Rain Dregs podcast presented by our friends at Canadian Club. And Ray, we talked about this off air uh, and we always tease how we have, we need to have more alumni on the Rain Dregs podcast just because of the looseness, right? The ability to tell those stories. And the game was so much different when when you were playing and Footer was playing. But um, I like to think that the experiences of today's player, are they're different, but they're still the same in terms of the camaraderie and the fierceness of compete and all of that. But I'm not so sure. But Footer was one of those guys, man. You didn't have to worry about his level of compete. No, you never did. You never, you know, I mean, he played the game the way it was played then and he played it as physically and with as much toughness as anybody like Mm -hmm. he tries to downplay it in the interview (laughs) he was terrible to play against like he was mean when he had two hands on his stick it wasn't because he was scared he was going to drop it (laughs) he was just waiting for the right time to cross check you but that being said it's not like he didn't play like he could play he yeah. could move the puck. He was a great skater, powerful. Um, and then when he got you in position, he punished you with a hit. Like he was a hard, hard guy to play against. As for the stories, Drake, there's no current player that's going to tell us a story about taking no. a, a teammate's bed and changing it out for a crib. They're just not going to tell you that because yeah. they, they just don't. But when you retire and you sit around and what you have are your memories, man, that's the stuff that you remember when Jeff Rogers and Sean Donovan <laughs> destroyed my room by putting everything on the bed <laughs> at the time I was furious. Now I can't even get halfway through the story and I start to laugh. It was amazing <laughs> that those guys actually thought this is the thing. And footer has, you know, they have, you played for 15 years. You got a whole yeah. bunch of those things. Yeah. I just, I, I, you know, I, you could have chosen a different path than, than TV and podcasts and radio and everything that you, you do. You could have gotten a, into coaching, obviously, into management. When I talk hockey with Adam Foote or I listen to him, you can tell that the, the, the fire still burns, right, in the belly. You can tell yeah. that he wants to get back in. And, and he's probably at a place in his life now or in the near future where he can do that because of Cal and Nolan and the fact that they're down their path already. Well, yeah, it's, he did say something kind of quickly, um, but it, it really resonated with me. He's like, you know, you can't be sitting in a hotel room all day waiting for a one hour dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I got to that point with Landon and like, you know, you sit around, they go to practice, he comes home, he's tired, he takes a nap and then he meets yeah. you for dinner. Right. So it's five o'clock. I'm in Des Moines, Iowa. I don't know anybody in Des Moines, Iowa mm-hmm. to occupy my day. So I go for dinner. It's the highlight of my day for him. Yeah. It's one more thing to do. Yeah. Right. He wants to go home. He wants to put his feet up. He's tired. And so um, then it gets to, I got to do something else. 
mm-hmm. you know, and I'm lucky I got this and, you know, and have been regularly busy and footer's been not busy for a little bit of time. And he's like, okay, I get, I get, I get the juice again. I get, I get, a, I'm too young to just sit here. Chris Abbott from CoolBet.co joins us on the Rain Riggs Hockey Podcast. Geez, what are we going to talk about? Not a lot going on uh, in the National Football League. Talk about a tough weekend to beat, and and I guess there's reason to be optimistic, right? We're just in the meat of the playoffs. It's fun. The atmosphere is jacked. But you look back at uh, the Rams and the Bucks and the pushback by Brady and company in that game. Uh, They fall short. The Bills, Kansas City, the drama near the end of that football game. Mm. I mean, I guess we could say we've seen something like that in the past, but that's just about as good as it gets, unless you've got a ton of money on the line and you lost on both counts. (laughs) Well, even people who don't like sports or don't like the NFL would have had to love that drama because it it was more more than sports. It was just the emotion of it all. And how, how good was the night game? We forgot about all the insanity of the afternoon game by the end of the night game. Right. It was like, oh, that was on the same day? Yeah. Oh, man. But, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, underdogs cashing, uh, you know, the first three games. Looked like they were going to do the, the fourth one, too. I think you got to do that last kickoff on the ground, not through the end zone, and yeah. you have it. But, uh, yeah, it was wild. And it was a great weekend for the sports betting industry. A lot of excitement, a lot of talk, um, a lot of money changing hands. Um, but, you know, it probably evened out. You know, a lot of people like some of the underdogs, and, and they ended up coming through. Chris, what happens in uh, in a game like Buffalo and and um, Kansas City, where the leads are changing so quick? Are people getting in quick and and now trying to hit the next the next connection point? Because it happens yeah. so fast. Yeah, people are live betting that all the way through. And what else we saw for that game? So a lot of people had you know. Um, parlay tickets with all the underdogs on them. And then once the first three cash, then it's like, okay, how do I maximize or at least hedge what's going on here? So, you know, you would have had a lot of people bet like an alternate spread on Kansas City. Mm. Um, You would have had people betting heavier Kansas City money line. When Kansas City got down early, then people were going to jump in on them again. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the fun of it. And that's kind of the uniqueness of the playoffs when we get to this point because people's tickets aren't games that are running at the same time. So they can make decisions in between the, the kickoff uh, if they have a ticket going. Best part is nobody's doing that with emotion either, right? No. So just, it's always clearly thought when it's... Stay uh-huh. cool and bet responsibly is what we like to say. <laughs> you yes, betcha. you do. All right, Bengals, Chiefs, 49ers, Rams. Uh, what do you like on both sides? Huh, I mean, it doesn't matter what anybody likes these days because it always gets thrown in the blender. But uh, I think I'm going to... I don't know if it's recency bias or not, but I think I'm going to still have to go with the underdogs here. Um, you know, seven points is a lot in a playoff game. We were kind of writing off Joe Burrow and the Bengals last week, uh, mm-hmm. going on the road. We came up with all the reasons why they couldn't win, uh, and they were great again. So to keep it within seven, you know, as a straight bet, yeah, you know, I think that, that spread's probably about right. I think we will see some action come in on Kansas City as we get closer to kickoff. Um, and, this, boy, this Rams 49ers uh, storyline is, is really interesting. I mean, all the success that the 49ers have had against the Rams in the last few years, this season included, um, they're always underdogs. It doesn't matter. They're, you know, even though, you know, we think that the Rams are, are star studded and that much better. So, and we keep writing off Jimmy Garoppolo and, and sure, maybe he's not the guy that got it done for the 49ers in Green yeah. Bay, but he's here. He's in the game. He's one of four guys left. So, I don't know. I'll probably do some sort of teaser with the with the two underdogs and and hope that it works out. I I really don't know at this point. I'm looking forward to it though. Have mm. Have you written your um, Sean McVay tweet that it's in your drafts <laughs> that you're just ready to send out? I know uh, you've got one in the head anyway. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's just it's just copy and paste every single week. The guy does the same thing. He calls a timeout when he doesn't need to. It's all about him, you know. Um, listen, I'm sure Sean McVay is a nice guy, or, or maybe he's not. Maybe. He's oh, I've just the- picked up on this, and it cracks me up week <laughs> after week. I just love love your account on it. Watching him coach, so watching him coach just drives me crazy. I just don't know why he has to insert himself as such a big part of the game. Just let your players do the talking. And as you said to Jimmy Garoppolo, he's one of four left. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready to jump on the Brady bandwagon, though, if he hadn't have been oh, last week. Oh, for Let me sure. Know. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, thanks for doing this, as always. Uh, I'm looking forward to the weekend, and I know you are, too. Thank you. Absolutely, guys. Take care. We'll see you out in Vegas, week. Chris. Don't be Absolutely. late. Absolutely. I think I owe you a dinner. You do. All right, Ask Rain Drakes Anything. Fire your questions to us weekly. You can do it on Twitter and Instagram at Rain Drakes or on the website, raindrakes.com. Um, let's go to Instagram first, right? Uh, from Ryan White. Ray, do you find it more nerve-wracking watching Landon play versus nerves when you were playing? Oh, not even close. Yeah. <laughs> Way worse watching. Way worse watching. When you're playing, you're in it. You're thinking. You're yeah. reacting. There's, you know, I can change something. I mean, the only thing I can do when I'm watching him is go for a walk. Right? Like, <laughs> if it's not... Like, there are days when, you know, he's playing in Germany right now, and the game's at five in the morning and I'm up at five watching on a computer Mm -hmm. and it goes good or bad. And all I'm doing is watching the game. There's nothing else to do. It's way more nerve wracking. And and has it gotten better or worse as he's gotten older? Like I, you know, I'm thinking minor hockey. I'm thinking junior hockey. You were there when he played his first NHL game. I mean, all of those things. So has it lessened with age or not really? Not really. I mean, when do you ever not hope your son or daughter does well? Right, right. Right, and so that's that's where, like, I just want the day to go good for him. I want him to have a, a good day. I want him to create some chances, hopefully score or set up a play and be healthy. And, and I want him to come out of it and go, yeah, that was, was a good day. That That's my hope. All right. Uh, Eric Wirtz on Instagram, Ray, wants to know uh, if we would like to see some form of shakeup to the all-star uh, all-star format or is three on three optimal for the type of event that it is, which is fan friendly and entertainment first. Well, I'd like to see it shaken up a little bit. Um, I have this idea that, well, three on three is kind of here to stay. It might change to four on four, but it'll never mm-hmm. be five on five. Um, five on five is, is going to end up like a scrimmage no matter what you do. But what about if the three on three game was, played on a smaller rank drags. I mean, they built an arena in Lake Tahoe. They can build anything. So why mm-hmm. not build it 25 feet shorter and 20 feet, 15 feet narrower. And it's three on three. So now the game's happening fast. It's, ha- it's happening faster. Yeah, and yeah, then in between, yeah. in between the two boards, the two sets of boards, why can't that be an open area where kids can walk around? You can have fan interactions with players you can sign autographs, you can, you know, talk, you know, like you can have, you can have something that's connective between the fans and the players. Like to me, um, smaller rinks are the way to go for this event. Uh, three on three becomes, basically it becomes like air hockey fast, like ding, yeah. ding, 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 ding. It's all over the place. That to me is a, a format that you can turn into a tournament in a much faster fashion. Have you pitched the idea? I mean, you work for a major broadcaster who happens to be covering the All Star. Yes. Have I pitched it? Nope. Yeah. I will in Vegas. Oh, perfect. I've got I've got some notes, Dregs. I'm gonna do you. It. Oh, very yeah, yeah. good. All right. Final question of Asker and Dregs from Twitter. Allie. Allie wants to know, Ray. Besides hockey, what are our favorite Winter Olympic sports to watch? Me downhill skiing. Yeah. Okay. It was the it was the one event that hooked me into the Winter Olympics outside of hockey. Like a particular the, downhill skiing, like the yes, giant slalom. 19, 19, 1976, Franz Klammer was uh, in Innsbruck, Austria. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, Austria is a is a major ski uh, haven. He was right. the last skier, the hometown guy. He had to go had to had to beat the time to win the gold medal. And I'll never forget the announcer saying he's all over the course. Like he (laughs) basically skied like as fast as he possibly could. And that hooked me into the downhill. I think those guys and girls are crazy. I think they're the speed that they go is just astounding. I I love watching it. You know, I I've got two that come to mind. 
uh, ski jumping automatically. I mean, I, that's just outrageous. And I think back of Eddie the Eagle and all of those crazy stories. Do you remember from- what he said on Carson? Um, Johnny Carson asked him, they said, you know, it might have been Leno, I don't know. He said uh, in the time frame, he said, so what's it like when you go off that ramp? And he said, well, your bum gets really tight. <laughs> the guy was terrified going off that thing. And, and speed skating for me is, uh, I, I, you know, especially when you've got the, I, I don't know what it's called, but you've got like five of them or oh, the six of them. Up. I, and they're crashing into one another. I mean, it's outrageous. Remember really? the Australian dude that won? Everybody yeah, else yeah. crashed. He came yeah. behind the line. He was so far <laughs> back, he wasn't in the crash. And then he just strolled across the like, gold medal. Would you look at that? That's outstanding. See, there you go. I don't think Allie was expecting those answers. So thanks for checking in with us, Allie. We appreciate it. Uh, and you can check out the Rain Rig social channels for Rapid Fire, presented by Kintech Footwear and Orthotics, keeping you active on your feet for life. A little bit later this week, we'll have another Rapid Fire with Adam Foot. All right. What's it look like for you the rest of the week, Ray? You're busy, you're um, celebrating. No, I'm actually, I'm home this week. Nice. Um, I was supposed to go to Seattle last yeah. night for Nashville, Seattle. Um, but given my entire house is COVID. Um, you're working COVID, hard at home though, brother. Yeah, you're working yeah, hard. There's, uh, as a, as a fr- friend of mine, Text me, he said, geez, how inconsiderate of your family to make you so busy. <laughs> but uh, everybody's doing better. The kids are back to school, Good. which great. is great. Um, so that was my game for the week. Um, so I will be at home and doing whatever is required here. Now, are you actually preparing meals or, or are you just ordering and delivering or what are you doing? My daughter-in-law is... Uh, uh, my son Matt's wife yeah. Manroop is a rock star, and knowing my incompetence, yeah, uh, she prepared <laughs> a bunch of stuff. I'm really good at heating it up. There's nothing wrong with that, but she also she puts a little pressure on because her food is really great. Yeah, and mine really would be very bland. I I'm very good at breakfast, right? Pancakes, yeah. eggs, sausages. You need them. Good I can whip them up. You know, I've got a, a, a busy few days ahead. Uh, I've got a jet ski Thursday. Snow yet? Oh my goodness, did we have a ton of snow? Yeah, I don't mind it though. It's old school stuff, right? It's like cutting your grass. It's mindless therapy. It's exercise. Um, I got a big few days ahead. Um, under your direction and recommendation, just finished season one of Ted Lasso. Um, and? Oh God, it was so good. I loved Unreal. it so. Diving into the next season. And I don't know if you started, uh, I guess it's supposed to be the final season of Ozark. Yeah, I'm through the first two episodes. I, I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, 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 how many has there been? Four? I've watched them all. Well, no, they downloaded, they dumped like seven, didn't they? For the there's first seven, run. There's going to be a yeah. break. So I just yeah. watched the first two. And yeah. uh, I'll get through the, the rest of the seven this week. Yeah. You know what? The first two I thought were, were good. Uh, actually, the first three. By the time you get to episode four... Oh boy. (laughs) I won't say more than that. There doesn't (laughs) seem to be a smooth path for the birds. (laughs) No, no, no. That is a, a I don't know, but I'm just going to go on a limb and say Javier is a problem. He's going to be a problem. Yeah. That's pretty easy to see. All right, buddy. Uh, Well, well, best of your family. Thank you. You get all that stuff watched up and recorded (laughs) and caught up. Yeah. And I um, hope, hope everybody has a great week, a safe week. And um, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. You bet. Uh, as we wrap up every week, a huge shout out to our partners who make the podcast possible. Coolbet.co, the free-to-play sports and casino games website. By our friends at Canadian Club Whiskey who ask, are you over beer? By Endy.ca. Remember, use code RD75 to save $75 on a mattress. By Kintech Footwear and Orthotics. Book a consultation at Kintech.net. By Boston Pizza. Pick it up or get it delivered right to your front door. They're ready for both. Let Boston Pizza do the cooking tonight. As Ray says, special thank you to you for listening, for rating, for sharing, for following the podcast wherever you do that, and for following us on our YouTube channel. 
Thank You, where you'll catch up on not only everything that Ray and I have to say, but uh, our video sessions, our interviews, and past interviews as well. So thank you, everybody. 